All right, so we are finishing off our Inspire series this morning, um, part five. Um, yes, part five. So we, uh, what we're going to talk about today as we wrap this thing up is how do we respond to the moments that we just completely blow it? And to the moments where we go off track, to the moments where, um, you, you know, when you go through the series parts one to four and, you, and you've bought fully in and you're living it out and then something takes you off track. Whether that just you got busy with success and busy with your own life and completely forgot to pursue after God or whether a hardship took you away. Because we think going through, so if you think about kind of the, the, the framework that we've been trying to paint here, because the question we originally asked is, is the church still relevant? Does the church still matter? Because a lot of people believe it doesn't. And so we were talking about how Jesus laid out the model for us and why God believed in the local church, why Jesus started the local church, and why everywhere you go, whenever people become followers of Christ, they seem to be drawn to each other. But in our day and age, people don't necessarily feel like the church has any answers. They don't really feel like the church has a whole lot of relevance. The answer is in governments. The answer is in policies. The answer is in advocacy. And so then we ask the question, what role does the church play? What are we supposed to be doing then? And so we started and we said, okay, well, the first thing that Jesus really clearly defines for us is the way we're going to operate is not going to be a heavy, hands down, we're better than you, you suck, be like us. It was going to be through salt and light. And we talked about the brilliance of that analogy and, and how that changes our perspective the way we look at other people. And then we said, well, to become somebody who is salt and light is hard. It's not easy. Uh, to love your enemy the way Jesus asks, to pray for those who persecute you, those are hard things. This is not just simple. This is challenging stuff. So how do you become the kind of person? So we talked about the model that the early disciples used. So as they were um, mourning Jesus going back to heaven and the loss of him for a second time in a couple of months, the, the author of the Gospel of Luke goes, okay, well, here's the things that these guys were focused on. So when they were launching the church after the Holy Spirit showed up, they focused on the apostles' teaching. They focused on intimate relationships. They focused on um, communion and the broader community. And then they focused on prayer. And those were the four elements that really made that up. And so we said that's what discipleship, a holistic version of discipleship, needs to look like in the church. And so then when you, when you go through that and you're like, all right, I want to be salt and light, and this time you'll be discipled, then you face moments where you need courage because there's just, it's a challenge. I would like it to be easy. I'd like to be able to say that I'm never nervous speaking to anyone about my faith. Fully confident in all situations, always. Not. Right? It's a challenge. We live in a culture where nobody wants to talk about faith. Right? We don't talk about government. We don't talk about faith. Which is why we have poopy government. And we have very poor understandings of what the church is. Because even in the church, we don't really want to have these. Because we don't want to avoid, the, the reason is we, we don't like conflict, right? So if I, if I talk to, to Fred, and we all know that Fred's a liberal. And so if we talk to Fred. Fred. Right? And so we laugh. We're like, ha, ah, Fred's not a liberal, is he? But then there's some thoughts planted. <laughs> Does explain the tight pants. I'm starting to get it, right? Nice, by the way. Nice. <laughs> right, but, but, but we don't want to talk about these things because they, they, they evoke in us uh, confrontation. They evoke in us conflict. We don't want that. So to avoid conflict, we just want to have conversations about things that really, really matter. So it takes courage to actually step out and do this stuff. But then sometimes when we have courage, we lose the idea that we're actually still supposed to love people. And so in our courage... Yeah, in our it's desire, very difficult to express courage sometimes, especially in conversation without being a jerk. Sure it is. Because, uh, well, they just got to hear the truth. And Trump would be a perfect example of that. Yeah. Very courageous. <laughs> Some phenomenal policies. Minus 10 on the compassion scale. Yeah. Like, he's just not a nice human being. You yeah. cannot just have courage, right? But, but that, that honestly, anytime, especially if, if you're online because you're not facing the person, you get this false sense of courage. Like, look at me, I'm going to tell them, right? Yeah. As a follower of Jesus, we, we say no. Love has to underscore everything that we do. And so compassion, not just love, but compassion has to be at the root of the things that we do and the way we view people, especially those who do not see things the same way we do. Right? And it becomes a challenge. So we get to all those, and all of you guys are like, yeah, good job, good preaching. But then you get to number um, five, and I think what we really need to address is how incredibly hard this is going to be and the likelihood that not only have you already fallen off the wagon once or twice between this last Sunday and now, 
but in the future you are going to continue to struggle. And it may look different. We, we talk about obstacles, and so those are some obvious ones. We talked about some of those this morning. Um, this was not something Ricky was planning on dealing with. Now, Leonard did not have this in his head that he was looking forward to this part in his faith journey. And, and so you, you get faced with some really unexpected things and some negative things. You talk about sudden losses, and you talk about um, financial stresses, and you talk about that. But, but it's not just the bad stuff. It's also the good stuff that pulls us away. Yeah, you can you could be in a situation where uh, you're starting a business and you you're, you're like I don't know how this is going to go and it's 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 scary. You're going to make an investment. You're going to pour money in, and you're like I just don't know if people are going to like hire me to whatever it is. It could be a framing crew. It could be a company that's selling something, and all of a sudden things start taking off, and you're busy and you you're you're growing that business. You believe God wanted you to do this. This is part of God's plan for your life. So you're doing it, you're doing it, you're doing it. And inside of that, you can just get caught up in running the business to the point where you just are so so busy that you're distracted away from any meaningful connection to, to God and community. And it wasn't intentional, it wasn't nefarious. It wasn't like you had this evil plan in your head that like, I'm gonna be like, hey, uh, you know, as soon as I get busy enough, I'm gone, I'm out of here. And it's just something that happens day after day. You're trying to be a good steward of what God is pouring in and, and what he's allowing you to do. And it just, it's something that can happen where you just, you just all of a sudden find yourself at a distance. You know, one Sunday or two Sundays or even it gets so busy that you're not even connecting with your spouse the way you need to or the way that you need to connect with your kids. And that's difficult inside of knowing that this is what God wanted you to do. Uh, and those are things that can happen to us. Those are real life things that, that actually take place in our life every day and how that can just draw us away from the, the, the place where God wants to, us to be inside of all those things that are going on around us. Hey, right, so... A good example of this is January is coming up, and in January we always do what? We make resolutions. No, we don't. Nobody makes resolutions anymore. Do you know why we don't make resolutions? Because what don't we keep? Resolutions. Resolutions. <laughs> right? Isn't that, I think it's kind of crazy, actually, that, that we've gone to the point where we're like, we're not even going to try. <laughs> I said, I'm not, I'm not going to work out. I'm, not, I'm going to save 30 bucks and not get that one-month membership to the gym. And pay We for both 12. know that <laughs> Lowen isn't going there, right? But we have all these really good intentions in our head. We know the things that we want to do. How many of you guys have ever been in a church service where you're like, I'm going to read my Bible every single day? Right? Especially in youth, we go to like those powerful Billy Graham ones and DC Talk would be saying, I'm aging myself. It was so good. We were in Toronto. The Sky Dome was filled. My parents had told me that only country music was Christian. And then I met DC Talk and my world was just like, boom. Well, and then I had a uh, Walkman with a cassette. You had a what? Oh, buddy. And you put a little DC talk into that. Michael W. Smith was considered hard rock. <laughs> Woo! Right? So. I could just picture you with a Walkman. <laughs> just oh, you dying picture for, it. Just dying for a Discman. Like, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to move on to CDs. <laughs> CDs. I mean, you couldn't, you you couldn't, couldn't walk too fast because <laughs> they'd shake. You kids don't know the struggle. That's where rap came We from. used to not be able to walk quick. Like, if you ran with a CD player, it was going to be like, oh, 100%, right? You're dropping now bars, you just man. play and you run. Not in my day. And then when we got done with our cassette, we had to rewind the sucker. With a pencil. Well, sometimes, and sometimes the little the stuff came out, and then you had to get two pencils. It was terrible. <laughs> The, oh, yeah, if you didn't want to play side two, right. And did you know, this is completely useless knowledge, no one ever needed or is here for, but what we had to do when we wanted to get a song off the radio was we had to <laughs> get a second radio with a cassette that you could record on so when our song finally did come on, you quickly hit record. And hopefully you didn't catch the announcer right. doing the introduction who is extending that introduction long enough that when people tried to record it, it just ruined the song. So. And then when the world got crazy, they came up with Napster. Do you guys remember Napster? Napster? Napster. <laughs> Hamster? Napster? It was Napster, right? What was it? Napster, right? And, and so Napster was this, they, they bypassed all the copyright laws so that you could download music, but you never knew if it was going to be music or a virus. And so it was like internet roulette, <laughs> and you didn't know, right? So there's so much thrill in it because you didn't know if you were going to lose your computer by downloading the song. It was awesome. You are such an adrenaline junkie. Oh, buddy, it was wild. <laughs> we are downloading two songs today. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> and especially the Christian ones because they knew Christians just trusted everybody, right? 
I should have known when it said Michael M. Smith. It was W. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, where are we? <laughs> On the history of Preaching. music. Obstacles. <laughs> Obstacles. Obstacles. Yes. Obstacles. Right, so, so you, it, the intentions are there. Those of you guys who were baptized, at the point of baptism, your intention was to always be faithful. Mm-hmm. To always be motivated. To always be attentive. To always follow everything God had set before you. That was your intention. I think most of us, we want to live out everything God has for us. Yeah. So, so how do we respond and how do we navigate the fact that we're just not perfect? And, and what I have seen in, in ministry in the last 11 years is you, you see it happen in a lot of different ways as to why people fall off. And one of the ways is exactly what I'm saying. You, you get excited and you say, I'm going to do this. And so you may try something. Maybe you tried the worship team or maybe you tried preaching or maybe you tried joining something or tried running youth and it just didn't go well. And it's just go, I quit. How do you respond to that? How do we navigate that? And so we want to talk at the end of this series about really one word, but I got to do two words to kind of get to the one word. The first is persistence. Persistence is doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. So persistence is that idea of um, when you buy a dozen donuts. (laughs) Go on. And you get through four and you're like, I can't do this. And it becomes difficult, but you just keep going until those dozen are gone. That's persistence. (laughs) I was going to use a running analogy, but I knew none of you guys would believe me anyway. So I'm like, that's something. Right? Or buying, how many of you guys have bought the uh, Gordita shop big box of tacos? Persistence is having another two or three tacos after they're like... Right? So persistence, is, it's difficult and you just keep going. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about more, you've already quit. You've already gone off track. You've already wandered away for whatever that reason is. And so really what we're going to talk about is resilience. Resilience is the capacity to recover quickly. If you've ever dealt with any addiction or any addictive behavior, you, you know that, that, that feeling that when, when you've Um, had freedom for like three months and then all of a sudden you go back into it and then you just spiral. Resilience is the reality that we're all broken beings and when we make decisions out of our brokenness, it's the capacity to come back to center quickly and not allow our failures or rejections or our fears and all that to take over and take everything on, but to recover. And so we felt like as we were going to talk about this, so how do you know what you're returning to. Because sometimes when we get wandered away, you don't even realize that you're offline. Yeah. Like you're not even aware of the fact that you've wandered away. And then all of a sudden somebody starts pointing some stuff out and you're like, well, how do I know what to come back to? Yeah. In sports, um, we, we talked about how we can kind of paint this picture in sports training. When you prepare for your actual time on the playing field, what you do in practice really matters. You need to practice the way you play, and then you're going to play the way you practice. And that's kind of the analogy. So if we think of the Acts 242 model, when you're looking at these things that were present in their life, those were things that were part of their practice. It was part of their daily structure, and that gave them something to return to. If we think about the pro sports model, when you get into a moment where things are just crazy and it's hectic and it's, the tension's high and it's, and it's very difficult, you return to what you've practiced to. That is the thing that's just going to come out. You, you think about uh, um, one, of, one, of, one of my favorite athletes to watch for a little bit while was uh, Tim Tebow. I like, Tebow, yeah, just because he, everything that he said he was going to do, he did. It was just crazy. And like, here's a guy, he was ter- he had the most, it was the worst throwing motion, like, I think in pro, pro professional sports. It was terrible. But uh, he tried to get it fixed. Uh, so he went to professionals that were like, you know, his mechanics, and they, they practiced, they practiced, they practiced. And then when he get into a game, and the pass rush was on, and like, he's facing the pressure, and, you know, he's going to get sacked, what does he do? He reverts right back to his original throwing motion, and, and that's the place he goes to. That's his foundation of where he returns to. Uh, and, and when we think of another thing that we talked about was, um, how many of you seen the... Uh, um, the series on Netflix called The Last Dance with Michael Jordan and the, if you guys are, who's Michael Jordan? Yeah, you, sad, sad. I'm now dating myself. This is really bad. You <laughs> talked about Discman and now I'm like, Michael Jordan, you know, like the... You the, were dating yourself for many years before yeah. we <laughs> came along. We could talk about that. It was, it was yeah, yeah, that didn't go well. I was, it was hard to get along Carry with. Carry on, anyway, Michael Jordan. So, um, <clears throat> what we talk about when we say persistence, 
when Michael Jordan first came into the league and they had an uber talented team, they were incredible, uh, very gifted. They went into the playoff series and they got trounced by teams that had been there before. Uh, they came back the next year and they, 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 got, they lost again. They came back the following year. Uh, what happened? Well, they weren't playoff ready. They, they didn't have a resilience that was built in from their persistence of training. Now, when you look at the broad spectrum of all these different athletes, they all trained hard. They all put their time and effort in. They all sacrificed. They all had like this equal playing field, but they hadn't been in those moments where they were going to be faced with a difficult loss. And how are they going to bounce back in that moment? And it took them a number of tries and that persistence to return, but a resilience to say, we're going to return to what we know and who we are, and we're going to come back at this again. And in spite of the fact that they faced failure, they, they had a resilience to them that got developed through those efforts and time where they stepped out into the unknown that when they came back their third year, they advanced past the, the stage that they got stuck at, and they advanced further and further, and eventually they won. Uh, we use that analogy because it's, it's very much like us in real life. We face different circumstances where God calls us into a, a, an area of life and we feel like we fail. Or maybe God says, hey, I want you to do this inside of your relationship with me. I want you to study. I want you to, I want you to be a witness. I want you to read. I want you to stay clean in this area of your life. And we, we try and we make it for two, three months, four months, and then we fail. How we respond to that battle, how we, how we react to that, really, uh, it, it's, it's important to understand that when that failure comes, when that humanity happens, are we resilient to be able to recover quickly and then act again as God leads. And what is that platform and foundation uh, from which we're going to jump off into that return to action? And what, what we've been saying is, is it's that Acts 242 model where you, you have those things in your life that give you uh, what you need as a person of faith to be able to step back into those things. So then the question that we want to go from there is, how do you become more resilient? Because nobody wants to let their failures to define them. Right? And I think about my kids often when I'm parenting them, there's specifically one that's going through, uh, one of my younger kids going through a, a phase where they keep making the same mistake. And then as soon as they get caught, there's just the sheer grief on the face of, how could I do this again? And so we, we keep talking about this, okay, so you're going you're gonna to fail in life, and when you make a mistake, what do you do? You own it. So all of us, from, from kid on, we're, we're taught this, and we want to do this, and we want to move forward. And just so you know, it's not Kelly. So Kelly's sitting with her head kind of like, oh, crap, Dad, shut up. No, it's not Kelly that we're talking about now, right? On a complete side note, guys, can I tell you a funny story about Beckett? I know this means not, I'm sorry. Um, so Beckett um, gets up really early in the mornings anymore, and then he'll come running to our room because it's better than waking up all the children. And so about three or four nights ago, he came into our room, and then this is, from deep sleep, this is what I hear. Give me all your money. <laughs> so I don't know what he dreamt or what he watched, but I died laughing. So, uh, Resilient. So how do we become more resilient? Um, Paul actually speaks into this a little bit, and we want to give you, give you uh, I think, uh, a couple ideas here. One is out of uh, Ephesians. So if you have your Bibles, um, you go to Ephesians 2. We're going to read from verse 19. And it says this, it says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. So really neat, I mean, there's a lot going on in Ephesians here in, in what Paul is talking about, but this idea that we're all members of a household. And in our COVID world, household has begun to mean a lot more. Right? I mean, that, that's an intimate group that the government's like, well, that, that is one place that we cannot overstep our boundaries. We cannot limit your household, at least. You and your immediate family can be there. And, that, and that's what God is saying. That's what we're a part of. And so Paul is saying, whether you're a Jew or not Jew, in our context, whether you're Christian, not Christian, you are a part of that household. And then he says, this household is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So we're not throwing away everything in the Bible. We're not throwing, the, the, the foundation that this house is built on is on the apostles and prophets. The people have built ahead of us already. And Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. And it is in him that the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And so when we think about um, developing our faith and we think about growing in our faith and we think about becoming resilient and having persistence and, and accomplishing everything God has for us, this really begins to matter because the question is, what are you building your faith upon? And I know that's, that sounds like a cliched question in a church. 
The answer obviously is Jesus. Guys, if, if the pastor ever asks you a question and you're not sure, Jesus. Okay? It's, it's not hard because what's the pastor going to be like? No, not Jesus. Well, that doesn't make us look good. So it's always Jesus. All right? So we know this, but then, then sometimes when these obstacles come, one of the obstacles might be that the church you attend falls apart. Well, if the church was the foundation, you're in a lot of trouble. Or maybe your relationship with your spouse will fall apart. Or maybe your relationship with your kids. Or maybe your relationship with the, the pastor. Or maybe the pastor or your leader or mentor um, has a moral failing. Or maybe God gives you something that you, you did not think is fair. And you face all these obstacles. All of a sudden, really, the, what your faith is built on is tested, right? Like, when, when you think about um, the story of the, the three little pigs. I know, we're going in a whole day. I know. <laughs> did you see him start? Wow. We didn't talk about this the no. first time. So... Um, you... Do you guys remember the story of three little pigs and the bear comes and all three build houses? In my DARPA was a bear. <laughs> you have no idea what my DARPA was like. You don't know me. Something comes. Wolf. A wolf. Give me all your money. It was probably body. a coyote. <laughs> So anyways, somebody that was hungry of some pork, all right? So, so the first house is built of straw, and it falls apart. Second, am I right with that? Was the straw? Second house was built of sticks. That's what actually my house in Mount Salem was built of, so surprised that's still... And the third house, what? Rex. Right, but it's all these little stories of, 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 of when the storm comes, you're going to see what really your house is built on. What your faith is built on. And so what Paul is saying is already, like, you come on in, come on into the household. If you're a follower of Jesus, you, you are a part of this household, but you got to understand what the foundation of your faith is going to be. Because if you miss this, you're going to really struggle with resilience, and you're going to struggle with persistence, and it's not going to take long before the first attack comes, and you're going to go, I didn't sign up for this. Okay, so a personal example from my life would be um, the story of my relationship with my wife, Juanita. So um, spent my whole life believing that there was going to be this person for me. Uh, and it took me 34 years, babe, before, uh, before, uh, before I found you. 34, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and part of the problem was she was so short that she kept getting overlooked when he walked by. <laughs> She's standing right now, in case you're wondering. <laughs> so anyway, dream come true. I, I meet the love of my life um, through prayer and seeking God being at 34, wanting to make sure that I'm stepping into something that God wants me to do and not just me trying to fulfill whatever idea I have in my head, but wanting to make sure that it's what God wanted. Um, We continue in a relationship. We get married. And six, seven months after we get married, we're at a youth conference. uh, And all of a sudden, my, my wife comes up to me and she says, I don't know what's going on, but I can't write straight. And her speech is slurring. Uh, It's a really weird moment. Uh, and we're like um, a bit freaked out, and I'm like, oh God, what is happening? Um, I've waited my whole life for this moment to be able to be together with somebody and to share my life journey with. Uh, And it's, in my brain, you can go to all those places that say, was this this the right decision? Did I really hear God? Did God want me? And you know, we, we go to the doctors, we're told that she's had an episode of MS. Uh, we go do all the, the, the MRIs. She goes and does all the MRIs. You probably can't even count how many you were at with all sorts of crazy machines and just insane two-year process, studies, research, all sorts of stuff uh, to come through the other side um, for the doctors to say that, well, it was a single episode, so she technically, medically speaking, doesn't have MS. But we say all that to say, in that moment, if I couldn't come back to, if she couldn't come back to the reality that we knew that this is what God wanted us to enter into and we knew who God was before we entered into it, it would have made that whole journey a lot harder. It would have made it much more difficult to be able to go through because we could come back to the truth that we knew that God put us together and God wanted us to go through that journey together. He needed us to face that thing that we faced, but we could come back to that truth and say, God is good and he knows what he's doing. We're going to trust him in this moment. 
So that kind of leads us into another way of saying saying that. Out of Hebrews 12, and so the author in Hebrews 12, we're going to read from verse 1, says this. He says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And when we were, we were thinking about resilience, really a lot of it comes back to a laser focus on Jesus. And let me explain to you the way this practically plays out. So let, let's use the, 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 the analogy out of the freedom series that we just did. Let, let's say it's an addiction. Let's say it's a sin. Let's say it's a behavior. You're going to church, you're doing all the right things, and then you just have a week where you just fall off. But the only way you come back, the only ability to have resilience is if you have a laser focus on Jesus and you believe that he is going to forgive you. And you get to this place where you're like, I'm either too bad for God and I need to wander away, but if you believe that he's as good as he claims he is, you can come back because you know you're going to be welcome. You think about the, the parable of the, uh, the, uh, the guy that runs away. The prodigal son? Prodigal son. The prodigal son, yeah. yeah. And the story of him saying to his daddy, give me all my money that is coming to yeah. me. And daddy yeah. says, okay, here you go. Yeah. So in the first service, I couldn't remember that either. <laughs> you are so throwing just, some different I, things at me now. I think so, this is payback because yeah. he never knows what I'm going to say. And now he's trying to do this back to me. This is great. Prodigal son. So parable of the prodigal son. So, so the, the idea, he wandered off from what a son should be. Like there is no way, shape or form, this is a good son. This is not a nice human being. But there's a couple of things that you see in that story. And the one is that the father is always willing to bring, have him come back. And so at some point he lost focus. And when he was able to regain his focus and he thought, at home, I have a dad, I have a family, I have everything there. And when he's able to refocus back on that, it allowed him to jump back in. Uh, you think about failures, and you think about, uh, often when I talk to people who have become Christians later on in life, they say, well, I've wasted so much of my life. Well, our belief is that God can redeem that. Our belief is that even if you feel like you've wasted a relationship or things are broken, that God is the one who can actually restore that and redeem that. I mean, that's his whole history. He did that with Israel countless times, where they would go through a terrible process. I mean, Jeremiah 29, 11 is one that everybody likes quoting, right? For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and, and to give you great hope and joy and all these wonderful things. But it was going to be after they went through some pretty difficult things. If we look at the, uh, the story of the prodigal son, <clears throat> he came to himself uh, when he was in the pig pen and he said, he, he remembered something about his father. Yep. So, what we're trying to say here is resiliency is a byproduct of relationship. Uh, having, having a strong, grounded relationship in who God is is where your resiliency is going to come from. Think of, think of that story. The prodigal son knew who his dad to be. He trusted in the character of his dad so that when he, in his moment, came to himself, he looked back at his father and he said, I know my dad. I'm going to return to who I know him to be. When you think about the story of, just think of another, a New Testament story that we could look to. Think about uh, the interaction between Paul, Barnabas, and, and John Mark. Uh, they're going to go out on their first missionary journey. Par, uh, Barnabas wants to bring along John Mark. They go out on their journey. They're, they're getting to the stage where, man, this is getting too real. Uh, this is getting a little bit hard. I don't know all the, 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 the details that led to, to Mark deciding that he was going to uh, take off. But what happens? He leaves. He leaves the mission team. Um, we, we, we see in the story, the story picks up later on, and there's a, there's a tension between Paul and Barnabas because Barnabas wants to say, okay, I'm going to give, Mark needs another chance of this. Paul doesn't say that. He says, no, he left off. We're going to leave him behind. What is the difference in their reaction between the two people? The difference in the reaction towards Mark is because Barnabas knew who Mark was. They had a relationship that was stronger, more grounded, more intimate, more personal, and he could look at Mark and he, he could see and he could trust that Mark, Mark screwed up, but he knew that this time Mark wouldn't. So inside of that, he trusted that if he gave Mark that opportunity, the real character of who that guy was was going to come out. He, he had that relationship. Now, we could blame Paul and look at Paul and say all those things, but even later in life, Paul, knowing more of who Mark to be, later says, send me, send me John Mark, send me Mark. 
because I know he's going to be profitable to my ministry. And as that relationship was formed, grown, and it was more personal, more intimate, he could then say, I want that guy on my side because I know who he, who he is and who he to be. And the same thing is true when it comes to our resiliency and how we respond to the things in life and who we know God to be. In the end, it's really a question of trust. Do you trust God in the tough moments to bring you back? Is God really good? And so as we go through this journey and we ask the question, does the church still matter to the world? I think the other question is, what does the world see in the church? Because they already see that we're not perfect. And they're very clear on that. And that is something that they are proud to pronounce. But do they see a culture of confession and forgiveness? Do they see a resiliency that when a church leader does fail, or when people in the church do fail, there's a rallying and there's a determination to make things right? See, I think the world needs the church now more than ever. I mean, it's just because I'm only alive now. But when I look around at the needs and when I look around at what people are looking for and hoping for, we would say we have it. I'm not going through life alone even though I'm mandated a six-foot bubble. I'm not suffering alone because I know that if anything happens to my family, I have a much broader group who's going to care. It gives me the ability to be resilient, the fact that I am in community and scripture and prayer. But for us as a church, we need to constantly go, is our cornerstone Jesus? Is what we're doing about Jesus or us? Is what we're doing about Jesus or are we just trying to fight for our own rights? Is what we're doing about Jesus or is what we're doing about just me? And those are big questions. But that's why Paul keeps coming back to that and saying, no, you got to understand, your foundation is what you're building on. You're not the foundation. And if your foundation is not right, it's going to end up looking like my house. And if you've been in my house, we're off like four to eight inches all over the place. You don't even know. Like, it is so much fun playing mini sticks in there because the ball just kind of goes... <laughs> Some of you guys haven't been in my house. There are floors, our bathroom floor is literally four inches in the matter of 10 feet. And it's like, it's like a little water slide. So when we have showers, it always goes down. But that's what happens when your foundation isn't straight. That's what happens when what you build on isn't level and isn't secure. And so for us, as we move forward, you can be at the church. You can be at all these things, but that can't be your foundation. Your foundation has to be Jesus. It has to be the apostles. It has to be the foundation that was already laid. And then we build on that. And we don't build isolated, we build together. And that's a beautiful picture, and it's what our, our world needs to see, and it's what we get to live out. And when we live that out, there's a lot of light, there's a lot of salt in that. So, let's close in prayer, and then we'll close in worship. Father God, we want to say thank you for the, uh, the opportunity to be here this morning again. Thank you for just being a God who brings so much light into our lives, for illuminating it with love and joy and hope and, and peace and for providing to us strength for, God, so much of the plans that you have for us. Thank you for that. Thank you for being so mighty and so true and yet so kind and so compassionate. We just want to say, God, that we love you. We ask that you would lift our hearts up as we, uh, as we turn to worship you again. We ask that you would give us strength for our day and for our tomorrow. God, help us to remember to treat one another as you treated us. Uh, and God, we'll give you thanks for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.